you all for coming. I'm Summer, I'm the curator here at the museum. Before we get started, reminder to please turn off or silence your phones so we don't have any disruptions. Um, so as you can see from the stuff lined up against the wall, we are getting ready for Shrimp Fest. So please visit our booth. Um, we're right in front of the Palace Saloon on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Um, and if you're a museum member, we'll be having another jailbreaks trip on March 15th. And this one is to St. Augustine. Um, so contact Phyllis if you're interested in attending. Patron level members and above get first preference for that trip. And then our final tea of the season will be on May 21st and we'll have a fashion, fashion show theme. Contact Thea for tickets if you're interested. They'll be available until May 19th. And then for regular upcoming programs, May is Historic Preservation Month. And we're going to be having another talk following that theme. So our third on third on May 19th will be with Jose Miranda, who will talk about the adaptive reuse of Nassau County Public School Number 1, which is now the Schoolhouse Inn. And then in recognition of Pride Month for June, our June Brown Bag Lunch on June 7th will be a live oral history with members of the local LGBTQ community discussing the history of LGBTQ activism locally and nationally. So that's it for announcements, but today we have Bill Tilson. Bill is Emeritus Professor in the College of Design, Construction, and Planning at the University of Florida, where he also served as Assistant Dean for International Studies and Service Learning, and the Director of the Preservation Institute Caribbean. He developed the first set of design guidelines for the Old Town Historic District, and he is currently the co-chair of the Amelia Island Museum of History's Board of Trustees. So everyone, please welcome Bill. Thank you, Sam. Reminds me, I was applying for a job at another university, and I talked to my father in business for a long time. I showed him my resume, which was about like this. <laughs> and he said, uh, I'll show you mine, and it was one page. <laughs> so that's what happens if you're in academia. <laughs> so Summer, let's, let's start off with the fact that this is uh, the month of May. It's been designated as Preservation Month, OK? Now, in 1973, which This, I've got this down for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. This was a week back in 1973. This actually came out of Pat and Nixon's uh, office. You know, they were big supporters of preservation. And then uh, eventually it became a month-long celebration. And that's what these two, uh, these two talks this month are part of that. And I'm sure you all know that preservation is a fairly important aspect of Fernandina. I still call it Fernandina because it became beach you know, a long time ago, just to kind of promote the fact that that's what you're here for. But we know that Fernandina is much more complex than just the beach. Okay. And what I'm going to talk about today is also a very deep and interesting subject that I can't scratch the surface of. I'm talking mostly about the building, what you can learn from the way a building is put together, particularly in a smart building. There's so many other issues that uh, are surrounding this particular house that would be an entire lecture series. And hopefully, we can do something about that in the future. Okay. So I want to talk about um, dating buildings through construction method and materials. That's really the focus here. And it's this house, which of course is no longer here, unfortunately, 801 Samorello Street. Okay. In a report in 1985 by the historian Paul Weaver uh, out of uh, St. Augustine, he was asked by the city to put together a survey of the historic resources of Fernandina. And it included Old Town, which you probably know was the last town platted by the Spanish in the Western Hemisphere. Okay. And the dates that they set up for that are 1811 to 1821. Now normally when you do uh, an historic district and you put down contributing buildings, 
They have to be within that time period. Okay. Now, Weaver and others said it's probable that there were two buildings that came from that time period that would be significant. So that's really one of the things we'll talk about. Did this house actually appear here in all of its conditions from 1811 to 1821, or are there some other issues? The others is right down on Estrada Street, which is also no longer there. Okay. So two buildings, whether you, whether you debate the actual age of them, as we'll see in the talk, or there's a possibility they're both a memory, which I think is unfortunate. And the house that we're looking at today, uh, we actually, I was asked by the city and the current owner, Tom Stevens, of this property, who bought it from the McDonald family in 19, I think 2002 was when it changed hands. Okay. And I was asked with a group to come up and look at the building, which was starting to be deconstructed. Okay. The difference between deconstruction and demolition is you look very carefully and you kind of disassemble a project, a house, a building, from you kind of reverse engineer the building to figure out how it was put together. I'm actually pretty good at this. I'm, I'm a lot better at taking things apart systematically <laughs> than putting them back together. <laughs> so I've done quite a number of, of forensic deconstruction, that's what it's called. I put autopsy in the report, which sounds a bit gruesome. Um, we had, um, when I was growing up, we had a, a friend of the family who was a forensic surgeon, pretty well known, and he asked me, uh, if I wanted to attend an autopsy, which I did, I found it fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, not that I'm doing that with people, but with buildings, <laughs> buildings you really find out a lot. Now, of course, there's a lot more than just looking at the construction. There's all of the historical background, you know, particularly in this, who owned the house, when did they, who lived there, all of that. I really can't touch on a lot of that today. I know that some of you in the audience, have a great deal of information about that, and it might be interesting to hear that at the, at the end of the talk. Okay. So just to remind you, uh, this is what Jose Miranda, who's a local architect, went to UF while I was there. He's going to talk about that. I think that should be pretty fascinating. Okay. Now, speaking of, um, of repurposing projects, we're sitting in one right here, the old jail. Uh, I wanted to show you a couple things here. Uh, this is another one, a very famous one, Peck High School, right? It's the Black High School here. Now, what's, what's kind of curious about this, this building is in the historic district, but it's not a contributing building because it was built outside of that time period. Okay? But it is, oddly enough, it's on the National Registry of Historic Places. Okay. <coughs> The architect, Reynolds, who was a, a prominent architect in Jacksonville, also designed the Peck High School. And it's not on the National Register. Okay? The, I think the city is putting through a new, uh, a new application, and I think we'll correct that. Okay? So when you look around town, this building, which was the old train station, now the Welcome Center, this is a repurposed project, done well, okay? This one is in limbo. This is the Santa Marine building, right? Um, I think the, uh, the Schaefer's that own, uh, are, are, I believe, are going through with a project on this, and we'll hope so, because it was, the owner um, was given a demolition by neglect uh, warrant, okay, which meant that this is something you'll see around. Demolition by neglect means that you have a property, a historic property, and you let it sit there until it decays. Okay. And in a way, that's kind of what has happened up in Old Town, the two houses. So we'll see with this one. And recently, Liberty Building's house was moved. Um, this is not in preservation circles. Moving a building from its original location is not recommended. But if it's a question of saving the building or not, then you move it. 
And I think that would have been, quite frankly, a really good solution for the house in Old Town, but it did not happen. I'm going to talk about maybe why that is. Uh, if you do want to move a house, call these folks, Hajima Moving Construction. They could move this building somewhere else. They're pretty, pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, I found this one in the state archives from 19, uh, 1876, and at that time, this was labeled the oldest house in uh, in Fernandina, which was old old town. Okay, and it said it was torn down. And you'll see stylistically, you'll see uh, similarities between this one and the other house on Summer Railroad Street. And if you drive around in the countryside, all throughout the South. I grew up in Virginia, and I remember these kind of buildings everywhere. You'll see that they're fast disappearing, okay? And many times there's no record of who bought the property. So here's a map of uh, George Clark, who was asked by the Spanish government to lay out the flat of Old Town, uh, starting in 1811, okay? And this map, this, this, this map is in uh, the National Archives. And Frank and Maria Dolheimer redid this map. I guess it's more accessible to modern audiences, like in 1936. Okay. Frank did the graphics, and Maria did all of the uh, translation from the original Spanish documents. Okay. So here are the lots who we're talking about right here. Like 14 and 12 on block four. And you can see the rest of it. Of course, the fort is no longer there. You probably know if you've been up to Old Town and you live there that the whole bank is eroded about up to here. Okay, so Marine Street is basically almost non-existent. Right? So here's a close-up. Uh, blocks here. Now this, when you see a little square like that with an X through it, that indicates a two-story dwelling. You see one like that with one. It's a one-story dwelling. This obviously is the church. This is a, a little bed, so it's a place to stay. Um, this is an eating establishment, and these are military, owned by the military. But what is interesting here, and this, was, this goes to 1821, there are no properties indicated on, that, on those two lots there, which is kind of, kind of curious. Okay? Um, I have, you know, these are pretty much um, gone through by a number of people on that, so at least from this information, there wasn't a dwelling on those two properties in 1821. Okay. Now here's, uh, do you know what Sandmore maps are? They're, they're insurance maps. They started by the VA Sandmore Company right after the Civil War. And it's a way of indicating properties and their value within a town so for insurance purposes. And these are fantastic documents. Museum has a good collection of Fernandina. Uh, you can find them online from the University of Florida and from the National Archives. And if you really want to track what's going on in a city, check the Sandborn maps. They're extremely accurate in terms of position. And you can't, this is outside of the scope of this, but uh, there are indications about dwelling, size, whether it's made of wood, okay, does it have a fireplace? And Historians love to look at these maps so they can track down problems. And when the survey, 1985 survey was done of Fernandina, they relied a lot on these maps to do that. So here in 1983, I'm sorry, 1903, we see uh, two separate dwellings, not connected, with an indication of a porch facing south. Uh, this is the 107 Estrada Street, which is also going. And these were the two buildings that Weaver and his group said could be from that time period. Um, this doesn't show the house I'm talking about, but notice, remember that house from 1857 they said was the last one? They're very similar in nature to uh, properties that live over here, probably built by the owners and following kind of a standard way of making something that had been there for generations. Many of those were just now the larger structure, here you can see the, uh, the Bell residence, the Pippi Longstocking house, so you can see where 
the plaza is. You can see uh, a tower up here, an overlook tower. And that picture was taken from this tower here. So in Old Town, you know, these lots were set up originally to be the, the Peronius lots were uh, 46 and a half by 93. The idea was you could, you could raise a certain amount of crops, corn, chickens, goats, they were basically to be self-sufficient. And in this photograph, I mean, that's gone. <laughs> but in this photograph, you can see how here's a very small uh, shared robber's uh, cabin right there. And then you've got a whole garden. And this is the way it was. In fact, when we were doing the guidelines, the first uh, trip that I made, made up here uh, was like 1999. And a lot of this. Was, some of this was still there, which was pretty interesting. That was when they had, if you, when it, if you remember, you came into Old Town, and they had the trailers, that were, the trailer park that was there. Okay. That was there. Um, here's another photograph from that tower, looking south. And this is interesting because this boardwalk uh, was paid for by the Seton family, and it allowed workers to get from here to the mill. There was also one. Um, see if I'm there was also one that went to uh, the lumber mill, which was on where the pokey plant is in that area. Okay. But you had a, a Catholic church there. There were buildings in the in the plaza by the by the government, and you can see how far uh, the constructions and waterfront developments were at this point in time. And this is. 801 Summer Street, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's circa 1910. Here's 1909. There's another building at a little outbuilding here, and you can see that they've actually connected the two pieces at that, at this time period. Now here's, um, here's a photograph of the house. I think from around uh, 1960 is what it says. I'm not sure about that, but that's what we have in our heart. Okay, it's still occupied. You see that? Okay. But here it is in February 2009. It's been unoccupied. And in fact, the owner, Tom Stevens, purchased this from the heirs of McDonald family, Greg Mosley's, I think, were. Yeah. At that point. Nancy Mosley. Yeah. And, um, and that was in 2002. So this building sat there for seven years. And then finally, uh, the city inspected it and said that it was unfit for habitation, that's what they call it. And so they were allowed uh, Stevens to get a demolition permit. But they said you can't simply bulldoze it. Demolition, you pull a, a backhoe up it and you just knock it down and take it away. In historic preservation, you're supposed to do very precise deconstruction of the building and document what you find. Now, we were involved with looking at this project for a few days. Okay? I think the demolition, I think the deconstruction, I probably would have done it much more detail. We'll talk about that in a second. Here's a view uh, looking north and from the east from Estrada Street. What is interesting about this building, you notice on the plaza, if you have a plaza, most all the buildings were required to face the street, face the plaza. And this one is right on the corner, but it faces some rail street, which I think is very unusual because the guidelines that Clark set up would say you must, you, you don't get a choice, you must face the principal street. But here, you know, they just built it. So another thing that Weaver and his group didn't get into the construction of buildings, they basically looked at them from the outside. How did they appear? What was their style? And this comes out of um, Henry Glassie's book. It was, uh, was a very well-known, um, was she well known? I think he studied, Peggy studied. Mm -hmm. um, Vernacular architects. Yep, and these are vernacular types. These are called double pens, um, just basically because you had an entry hall or um, 
and two rooms on either side. So when you look at when you look at this building, if you were just looking at it and trying to pinpoint its style, it basically fits here pretty well. You know, <clears throat> drive up to you know, go to McClinney, drive into the countryside, all through the south, you're going to see projects that work like this. And they date back. In fact, you can find projects that were built in the 60s that look like this and have similar kind of characteristics. And this has a lot to do with the way people built in rural areas, OK? Um, here's a house out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, that's been preserved in a park, which I think it's too bad we couldn't have done that with this one. And you can see here, there's a fireplace in the center, a porch, I think it was filled in. This is the front porch we were looking at in two basic rooms, OK? And this is the uh, kitchen sort of bathroom area that was in, and a roof. Okay, here, they started to take things off, so we're going to talk about how it's actually put together and what can we learn from that. Okay? And you can see, you know, we're starting to pull off siding, and there's a lot of siding that came from the 1850s and siding that came from the post-war era. Okay. This is pretty much the way it was. So what we're going to look at is some conditions of how things are made. This up. The oldest part of this house is really the four corners, the posts, and the roof structure. And the way it's made is the way they would have done things in the early 19th century up until, say, and if the whole house was like that, I think it's conclusive proof that it came from that time period, but it's not. <laughs> These are really the only things that seem to be from that era. Okay, so we're going to talk about brace frame construction a little bit. Was it pegs or nails? Pegs, no nails. If you're, if you, the way they were built there, you basically didn't use nails to put structure together. They were pen, mortise and tendon, pegs, nails were for other things. Okay. So here, here's, um, this is Kerry Carson is the director of preservation at Williamsburg. And I actually worked with him on a house that George Washington slept in in Barbados. <laughs> Supposedly. So the deconstruction of certain parts of it would try to prove that it had what came from that era, and then other records would prove that Washington slept there when he was a, a teenager. Okay. But here's, this, here's uh, you would expect, if this was brace frame, there would be a hole, and then there would be a cypress or hard pine post that would be set in the ground. Okay. And then on top of that, you would join the frame to those pieces and interlink them and brace the corner. Here's another structure there. So we'll, we'll start to look at how things are put together and try to determine if, in fact, it actually is consistent throughout the whole thing. Um, now, if you're doing a really accurate survey with a historic American building survey, you have to document every single piece in the whole building, measure it. Right, photograph it and make detailed drawings like this. That wasn't done on this project. In fact, you can imagine a simple building like this to take it apart, measure every single element, and then redraw it accurately with all of the details is months, months worth of work. That, I guess, just wasn't feasible. Now, there was. Um, there was a possibility that we could have laser scanned the house on Estrada Street, but it, it, things fell through on that. But this is an interesting, rather than hand measuring all of those, um, they now have laser scanning that allows you to uh, get detailed information down to a millimeter. Okay. An asshole, they could scan this and all of us would be represented <laughs> in great detail. Okay. In wires, everything. Okay. And 
here's one they did um, a Jackson rooming house uh, during segregation. Had a lot. Uh, Martin Luther King spoke there. All the great jazz people played there or stayed there. Um, let's see if we do this real quick. We're just going to look at a quick section here. So this is a result of the laser scan, which a little, looks a little fuzzy, but in fact it's incredibly accurate. And this building has been abandoned. It's now been redone. Okay. And then it turns into drawings. Mm -hmm. okay. Now the other thing, that building, because of its, uh, that's enough. That's <laughs> you, get, you get the idea. I think this also points out, like on the Liberty Billings House had been occupied for all this time. And uh, if you look at the life of Liberty Billings, it's uh, you know, pretty fascinating. And so, there's a, there's a kind of historical uh, power and momentum there. And even though this is close to collapse, because of what it represented in that time period, it's been redone. But the thing is, when you look at small, like rural houses, you know, those are gone in a heartbeat. Okay. Um, let's look at a couple of things. When you look at lumber, you can kind of get a good idea about the age based on what the marks of the saw are. And here's a pit saw, and I'll show you what that's like. Uh, I tried that out in a workshop, and it was eight, I think I did it for about 30 seconds, and that's, that's enough. Okay. Here's a, a band saw called a muley saw that goes pretty much straight up and down, and of course circular saws. Um, and what's interesting, the first circular saw mill in Florida was near Jacksonville around 1850. So you're really not going to see, particularly in the south, you're really not going to see circular saw marks on lumber before 1850. Okay. And of course we know, you know, look at this, you know, 87 saw, um, saw mills in Florida. You know, major production here in Flamandina also. South Georgia. And of course Clark had, um, over by Egan's Creek, Clark had a sawmill. I like this one. <laughs> this is the first <laughs> part of the sawmill. <laughs> Here's the idea of uh, a pit saw. In fact, you, you know Saw Pit Creek up on Big Salvin? Mm -hmm. You know where they have a boat ramp and all that? There was a saw mill down there. And it floated lumber and you had a saw pit okay. mm -hmm. cranking stuff out. And these are just some other elements here. These actually go back to Roman times. You know, they're, they're indications that the Romans actually had a border power saws to cut things, and we're just getting around to figuring that out. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, okay, here's a short video of pit sawing. Is the uh, is the southeast corner of that building? Now this is obviously a modern addition here. Okay, it's concrete block from post-war, okay. and that's supporting the porch. And the porch was has modern dimensional lumber on it, so it was probably replaced. Okay, and you can see indications of what might be uh, 
a mortise and tenon joint in the corner, which is consistent with that kind of build, okay, brace frame construction. So this is pretty, this is pretty exciting when we first took those off. And it seems to be resting on one of these posts that I showed you in the earlier drawing, okay. But look at this. I'll talk about marriage marks in a minute. Marriage marks are when you took two pieces of lumber and cut and they're made to fit each other, nothing else. They're put together and you mix. You put one, two, three, and one, two, three. Here we have a diagonal with the number four scratching to it. Doesn't make sense, okay? And there are also modern nails that hold, hold this together with no, uh, with no mortise and tenon. Well, interesting, I don't know if you can see it here, these look like pit sawn or a buy-in saw, so that's also interesting, okay? This has been deteriorated, which this is a problem with a lot in the building. There were insects, water damage, and the structure was beginning to fail. Here's a, here's a modern nail. Here's a, what used to be a brace frame construction um, joint, but it's fallen to pieces. Okay. So here are those marks pretty clearly. Okay. But we're going to look at the top of that same board. It's sawn with a circular saw. <laughs> okay, so the whole building is filled with these contradictions, which I find it's not about simply it's 1821 or earlier or not. I think what's more fascinating is that it could be 1821 and 1850 and 1960, and all of these things are contained in the building, right? Now, here's that marriage mark that doesn't belong anywhere. There's another one. That belongs with that other marriage mark, but it's a vertical post. Okay. And underneath the house was really fascinating because you find here's the marriage mark number 13. And what kind of saw made this be? It's a circular saw, right? So it can't be any earlier than 1850. And then there are other beams underneath the house which are supporting the thing, which are just kind of laying on another beam. They're not nailed. They're not, they're not post. Uh, they don't have a post in them, okay? And if, if you're looking, does any of you have an historic house that you've been working on? Yeah, I've done, I've lived in three of them. In fact, I'm living in my first contemporary building that actually where everything actually works. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of boring. <laughs> but if you do that, um, take a look at the nails, okay? And it's a really good indication of when the, when the project was, was made. We found, we found no nails, nails up in this category, but we found nails all the way down through here, all over the place, okay? And here's some, that's uh, these type right here, type B, 1820s to 1900, and these are some nails that we collected from the house. Here's another joint. You probably get bored looking at joints, but these are exciting. <laughs> you can tell a lot. But look at the foundation. But here's a support, a vertical support, mm -hmm. and we've got probably uh, an older log with a few shims underneath it. With this, and these are not joined at all, they're nailed, okay? But then down below, you find other pieces that, this used to be, uh, this used to be, here's a mortise and tenon joint, and there was a piece coming out this way, but this is being used underneath the house to support other things. Okay, and here's another one. This obviously is something that's going up in, by traditional techniques, but it's used to support a beam underneath the house. Okay. Look at that. Obviously, this has a pin in it, and you can see clearly, and it's resting on a post, but this is simply sitting on the ground. Okay. These are circular, but these are circular saw marks on this piece. So it's a newer piece of lumber put together with an old technique. 
this is not me, this is John Bay who helped me. Right. Uh, he's uh, uh, an old house expert, despite his young age at this point. Mm -hmm. But what he's pointing to is a, a piece of lumber. This is a pen right here. A piece of lumber that has those dimensions which would never show up in a house of this small size. Okay. But here's another piece. This is another supporting beam. So on the bottom, we have uh, a rotten log. Right here, how do you think this is cut? With, with an axe. Okay. And here is a bird's mouth uh, connection for putting a joist on. Okay. But the dimensions of this are huge. So we're getting every indication that the house is being made up of parts from other locations and put together. Mm -hmm. uh, which is fascinating. It, you can easily say, okay, it didn't come from 1821, end of story. But the more interesting thing is you've got people that are rebuilding or building something using whatever they can find in the neighborhood okay, or friends that have stuff. Okay. Here's another one, support beam, an old piece, earlier lumber and a circular saw on board. Same here. So every single foundation was made up of parts. Okay? You could have a concrete block on top of a piece of ads cut lumber, uh, on top of, uh, I don't know, some shims, whatever you find around. Here, it is a, this is just resting on the ground. Okay? But this is the way you would have built one of those posts for brace frame construction. You've got a, a, a timber that's been debarked, and then you cut it with an adze, lay it up, and then you can set the structure into it. Okay. But that's, that's underneath the house with other stuff. Okay. And look at this. This is a, an amazing piece of wood. That joint, that would have been laid up, and you can imagine the size of that building. These are like, I'm sorry I don't have a measure in front of it, but they're like 12 inches thick. Mm -hmm. So you would have made a wall out of that. Okay. Not for this house, <laughs> but something else, some other building. Here's another piece that would have been in the ground that obviously is yeah, supporting the walls. Now, when we got to the house, there had already been were things taken away. Here's one of my graduate students that doing some uh, measurement of the bricks that we found here. But an earlier photograph that I ran across, there's kind of like a Victorian mantelpiece that covered that. that <coughs> so the house was basically stripped of a lot of, of information when we looked at it. Okay. And basically, that's not the way you should do things. Okay. If you did take this off so you could study the, the structure here, this would be kept uh, and uh, documented and laid aside, okay? But it disappeared. Okay. So we're back to the roof here. Now, what do you see here? These two pieces of wood belong together, okay? These are called marriage marks, right? So this was each piece, each joist up here, um, I'm sorry, each rafter is, um, is cut specifically to fit with another. Right? This is not like the houses we do now. Everything's exactly the same. You nail gun it together and that's it. Okay? Um, and there's the pen, wooden pen that's knocked in. Here's another one. Okay? Four marks here, four marks there. This one, no marks at all, a post, and the number 11. <coughs> so basically, when you get up and think they were not in a sequence and out of order, and that really indicates the fact they found those pieces or repurposed them in a house and built everything else around. Okay. Uh, there was a very brief archaeological uh, ah! test of the site to see if there was anything significant. Um, here's the, here's the, uh, the field that um, the archaeologists looked at. So did these test holes 
little quick sketch of all of the, the posts around there, and they found nothing significant that would warrant a further archaeological study. So here's, here's an interesting supposition that I can't prove, but is think, worth thinking about. 1898 hurricane struck the area, mostly up in Georgia, but it did significant damage to the city, particularly the port. This is from the Weather Bureau report of 1898, and this is a photograph uh, looking towards the water right after the hurricane. So we know it damaged brick buildings, wooden buildings. And here's Captain Davis's residence up in Old Town, which is still there, after the hurricane, with his crew trying to put the thing back together. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is a substantial bill. Right? David sent money, he worked with carpenters. And so this one's just taking damage. So imagine if there was a whole structure here at that time, what could have happened? To so um, a colleague of mine looked at this building in, uh, along with Paul Weaver again in 2007. And they didn't have access to the things that we're looking at here. But they supposed that the building, this frame of it was moved to this site and then remade after the hurricane of 1898. Now, I don't know how we could prove that, but I think it's an intriguing notion. And I think the, the physical quality of the building that we've been looking at kind of supports that. If you take the hurricane out of the, out of the equation, you still have a project, a building that is built with things from all over, many different time periods. And that's what I think makes it really fascinating. Okay. So it's possible some structure was on this property during this time period, but we haven't been able to prove it. Okay. Looking at the whole building, I think it's probably not early, the whole thing's not early in the 1850s and more likely uh, later on in the 19th century. And I think of the basic structure was moved from another site and or rebuilt after the hurricane of 1898. I'm not going to show you. So I think it's unfortunate that uh, the recommendations made by us and Shepard and Weaver were that the building should be preserved in some way, moved, or more extensively documented. Uh, that didn't happen. Okay. So the only thing we have about it are photographs, there's some basic drawings, not anything like the Historic American Building Survey drawings. We didn't have laser equipment to scan things like that back then. Okay. Um, and we have oral history stories, people that knew the family, lived there, whatever. So there's a lot we don't know still about this, uh, this particular problem. Okay. So that's it. Yes, sir. It's quite possible, and I think uh, uh, Shepherd, Herschel Shepherd, um, who lives in St. Augustine, was a professor at UF. He's a well-known architect who restored the Capitol building. He also was the architect on Fort Clinch, put that together. And that was his supposition that some of those buildings came from fortifi the fortifications. Okay? Mm -hmm. And we can't actually document that, but that's a pretty good guess, an uh, educated guess. It's a lot simpler to take an existing palisade rather than get you and your son on a all area. That's, that's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. I sort of grew up in that house. My uh, my great great grandmother was Florence Clark McDonald. She she moved. With my grandmother. My grandmother was born in 1894 in St. Mary's, Georgia, when Hope Clark moved to St. Mary's to avoid the rebels on Lee Island. Yeah. He was married to a black woman. Right. And my grandmother was two years old when they moved in 1896 to Old Town. Now, whether it was that particular house or not, but I remember her telling me that one of my uncles was born in the house directly across the street from that house. 
Now, I do remember as a kid, some of the family members building another porch on the front of that house. Uh -huh. Whatever else they did, I, I can't say that I remember all of it, but I do remember them putting a, like a cement porch was there. Yes. Out. Yeah. I, I do remember that part. Mm -hmm. But her name was, I don't remember the year my, my great grandmother died, but Florence Clark McDonald, that was her house. <laughs> But she was born in 1874? No, no. My, my grandmother was born in 1894. Okay. She was two years old when they came up the St. Mary's River to Old Town to settle. Yeah, I'm just looking at Florence McDonald from the 1910. Okay, that, that, that's, that's my, that's my great-grandmother. Great-grandmother, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think, Neil, I think what you're pointing out and what we were talking about earlier is that there are uh, they're unrecorded stories about all of these places. You know, the bigger houses, uh, you know, things that had prominent individuals, whatever, we know about them. But all of these houses for fishermen, workers, and farms or in the forestry, uh, they're, they're fast disappearing. In many cases, they don't have deeds. Okay. Uh, so I, I think this is a, a vastly understudied area. And in fact, one of the difficulties that you find in historic preservation, which comes out of the you know, 50s and 60s, is that uh, houses or buildings that were added to, like the one in, in Old Town, were said, okay, that's not consistent. There are too many things that don't add up. So it's not historically interesting. I think part of that has to do with the Pexin. I think part of it's not on the National Register because it had additions that were not like the building that Reynolds designed. But that's one of the fascinating things about these, is that there are all sorts of time periods that you can see in the way it's put together. And I think that's equally fascinating. And those places are disappearing as we speak. And I came from central Virginia, and so I used to drive around the countryside and stop in people's houses and talk with them. <laughs> the work well, back then, there was this white kid coming up my lawn. You know? Bill, uh, yeah. you spoke of the church facing the plaza. It was a Catholic church. Yeah, I said Catholic. Was, well, I think it was St. Peter Clay where they moved to, to town there. Yeah. Yeah, they, they moved to the 2nd and Calvin. Yeah. Is that still there? I can't remember. 2nd and Calvin is. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. still there. Yeah, it's just not a church. It's a home it's now, though. It's a private, yeah. private residence. Yeah, right. Yes. Um, I'm not familiar with your supposition that uh, Palisades from the floor might have been just absconded by people living around in Old Town. Has, is it possible to date that lumber if you had the money to do that and figure yes. out when it yeah, was spelled or something? Yeah. Well, Does I think I misunderstood. Right the Palisades that you're talking about were the Spanish fort on the plaza right. that you were talking about. Right. And that was pretty much gone. Yeah, that's, I don't know the exact timeline of what part fell into the water and eroded, but the, when you do that work on the houses, do you ever try to date any of the timbers that go way back? Uh, yeah, you can do it by the way it, it's it's built and constructed, but to be more exact, you have to do chemical analysis yeah. of the wood, which I have no that. clue yeah. about. Okay. But it would be interesting but to see if any of them were yeah. laying around from the time that yes. the fort was built. Yeah. And that requires, number one, it requires a commitment to do things like right. that, and yeah. then to assemble the expertise. And it costs money. Right. And a lot of these, part of the reason this house is not there has to do with money. Yeah. Yeah. But it gives you conclusive results. Conclusive results, yes. You could get close to the tree range, but you'd have to, yeah. as close as all you're going to get, because you've got, yeah. Just two trees grow in the same year, bang at the same time, 20 feet apart, to have a different growth rate. Yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. But it's better than nothing. Yeah, it's better than nothing. Yeah. Well, there was, uh, there was archaeology done by uh, uh, Bullen and Smith on the, they found the outline of the, uh, of the fort up there mm -hmm. back, and that report is in the museum. You can find that. That's pretty interesting. Excuse me. Was it all the same wood? No. 
Well, I mean, but is that another indicator of when it was built? I mean, depending on what was the primary lumber that was used? Yeah, it's possible, but people still make things out of hard pine. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, the, and cypress that you pull out of swamps, it's been there for, you know, 150, 200 years. Actually, my house in Gainesville, which was built, was built in 1928, um, all the structure of it was hard pine, and then a lot of the other boards were cypress that, and I had to replace some of that, so it was a, a sawmill that got lumber out of the swamp and sawed it up, so it was pretty much like it was. Oh. Yes, ma'am. Um, my name is Glenda Jenkins, and I wanted to give just a little cultural context to the house, if I may. Yeah. Um, I'm a representative for the Gullah Geechee Nation uh, for Florida. And at the time that this house was, it was being determined whether it should be retained or deconstructed, I was actually a news reporter here, so I, I had the opportunity to cover the fact that I was with family when they walked into the house for the first time after many years and had an opportunity to look at many of the the antiques and things inside. And then in the few years that advanced, I was covering one of the family members who was trying to move the house from that lot to her property, which was just a few lots away. And the Historic District Council had a decision to make, and that was were they going to uphold the rights of the property owner who wanted to be able to maximize his investment on the lot, or were they going to give her time to be able to pull together the resources, which she would have been able to do to move the house, and of course they decided the latter. But the cultural context I wanted to provide is that as Gullah Geechee people, our living arrangements are uh, what you would see in West African culture, which is uh, the village arrangement. So therefore, when you talk about the front of the house not facing the plaza, I think um, Mr. Frank and of course uh, uh, Ms. Triad would say that their family was nearby. Yeah, so the point. door and the entrance to the house was facing family, would not have faced the plaza, because that would not have been uh, what a family compound would have looked like um, out of African culture. Yeah, and the final point I want to make is that the value that preservation um, circles place on vernacular architecture, if you all, as you've already mentioned, is uh, little to none. Yeah. And so therefore, we will continue to see structures like this disappear because they are not given any deference in the preservation yeah. community. Until that particular paradigm changes and we understand that African descended people actually brought skills with them that probably would have allowed that house to survive the hurricane of 1898. It's questionable whether it did, but the fact that they were able to resource materials from other places in the community, from other structures, and then integrate those materials into a structure that lasted until whatever year it was, 2004, 6, what have you, 2009, 2009 yeah. wow. speaks to the skill. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, that's very good. That's good. I, I think the, um, the, the, the preservation movement is starting to change, although slowly, to try to address that. It's not moving fast enough to protect places like this. But it's a very good point. I've forgotten if you said anything. What happened to the other house? The two? That was deconstructed. It was deconstructed. Yeah, I was, in, I, I was asked to come look at it and talk to Shaw. I think the Shaw said that. Cassidy Shaw. Um, Where was it located? What's that? Where was it located? On the Estrada, just down the street, <clears throat> right behind the, the house on the corner of Somorellos and Estrada on the west side, and then right behind that, that's where the house was. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah, that was taken. That was that was taken apart by uh, by by Mr. Shaw, who has a background in construction. I think they did. I haven't seen the. They, but was, they didn't document it. They were supposed to photograph it and make all of the documents and submit that to the city. And I think they did, but I've not seen it. Uh -huh. So I. Okay. But I was just curious. What year was it all taken down? Did you think? Oh, uh, gosh. It was last 
last year, I believe. So, regardless if you, if you still want to debate the actual dates of those two buildings, I think it's really unfortunate we don't have them around uh, in some capacity in order to tell that story. Mm -hmm. So we have to do little things like this. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much.